On the Ganges River Delta, where cholera has remained a problem for centuries, lies Dhaka. This laboratory, established for research on the prevention and treatment of cholera, was placed in Dhaka where the disease occurs every year. Patients with cholera are brought by ambulance from remote areas for treatment. By the time a patient reaches the hospital, he may have lost 10% of his body weight as diarrhea and vomitus. In a 50 kilogram man, this amounts to five liters. He may be in shock, pulseless in all extremities and profoundly weak. He cannot stand or even sit up. It is entirely possible in cholera to be reduced to such a state in a few hours, but usually it takes from 12 to 18 hours. His eyes are deeply sunken from fluid loss. His fingers and toes are shriveled and cold. His skin has lost its normal turgor. His mouth and tongue may be dry unless he has just vomited. Patients are usually conscious and oriented, but senses may be dulled. In extreme states, the patient may be unconscious and close to death. If the water and salts lost in the diarrhea of cholera are replaced swiftly, and then a balance is maintained, survival is assured. This same individual is now well. With proper treatment, cholera patients recover quickly. When cholera strikes in areas where practitioners are not acquainted with modern treatment methods, many people lose their lives. Case fatality rates in some affected populations may be more than 60%. This unnecessary loss of life creates panic, seriously interfering with effective control measures. Panic can be avoided by proper treatment, because treatment can prevent deaths in even the most severe cases. Although they represent only a small fraction of the number of infected persons, these severe cases are the greatest challenge to the physician. When a cholera patient is brought to a treatment center, he should be weighed on arrival. This information is used to judge the amount of fluid needed. After weighing, while the patient is being placed on a cholera cot, the doctor can rapidly evaluate the patient. The sunken eyes and cheeks indicate severe dehydration, as does tenting of the skin. Pulse can be felt quickly and easily. Both volume and rate should be noted. The blood pressure should be measured if possible by feeling the brachial pulse as well as listening with a stethoscope. On admission, the brachial blood pressure is often unmeasurable in severe cases. The respiratory rate and depth are generally increased in cholera due to the accompanying metabolic acidosis. Prompt restoration of lost fluids and salts is the primary goal in treating cholera. Treatment must therefore begin immediately in patients with vascular collapse. Placement of an 18 or 20 gauge needle in an appropriate vein is crucial for rapid infusion of fluid. 
A second vein may have to be used to achieve adequate flow. In small infants and children, or even adults with difficult veins, it is very important to be skilled in performing vena punctures at a variety of sites. Any superficial vein of the legs or arms may be used. The external jugular vein may be the most accessible superficial vein in a young child and can be used in adults. The use of scalp vein needles has greatly facilitated entering small veins and maintaining infusions in them because they are easily manipulated and lie flat when taped down. If such a vein is not immediately found, the femoral vein should be used to give fluids. Cut downs are not needed in cholera therapy. The initial rate of infusion in a severely dehydrated adult like this one should be a minimum of one liter in 15 minutes. Several liters are usually required for patients pulseless on admission. Such patients need fluids equal to 10% of their body weight. This 40 kilogram man required four liters. When rehydration is complete, the patient should have a strong radial pulse and normal blood pressure. His eyes and cheeks are less sunken and his tongue is moist. His breathing should be slow and regular and his skin should have its normal turgor. After rehydration is complete, the rate of fluid therapy should match the measured rate of diarrhea. All excreta and vomitus must be collected and measured. The cholera cot channels all stool into a receptacle calibrated for easy monitoring. Urine is collected separately. A waterproof sheet with a sleeve attached assures quantitative collection of the stool. Continuing monitoring of intake and output, recorded on a simple bedside chart, is essential to the best care. The characteristic rice water diarrhea of cholera is a straw-colored watery fluid with a slightly fishy smell, not fecal in character. The fluid lost in cholera is primarily this liquid stool. Vomiting may contribute significantly during early rehydration. A patient can purge up to 14 liters in an eight hour period, 20 liters a day, and 100 liters in a five to seven day period. This fluid contains sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, and chloride. Fluids given in treatment should match the composition of fluids lost. This is the composition of the so-called 5-4-1 solution, an intravenous solution commonly used to treat cholera. The salts are in the same proportions as in the cholera diarrhea of adults. Children have slightly less sodium and more potassium in their diarrhea, but patients of all ages can be treated with the same intravenous solution provided they are allowed oral water as desired. Special electrolyte solutions are not necessary. Acetate or lactate can be substituted for bicarbonate in this solution. Ringer's lactate or normal saline can be given if extra potassium and bicarbonate are given by mouth. Since children with cholera sometimes become hypoglycemic, the addition of 2% glucose to their intravenous fluid is recommended. After rehydration is complete or if the blood pressure is normal on admission, Patients should be treated with oral instead of intravenous fluid. Use of oral therapy can markedly reduce the amount of expensive intravenous fluid needed to treat cholera patients. The oral solution used for cholera has less sodium and more potassium than the intravenous solution and is suitable for treating children as well as adults. 
glucose is necessary since the solution can only be absorbed in the presence of glucose. If glycine is available, its addition further facilitates absorption. 8.25 grams can be added to each liter. The ingredients of this solution are readily available in most areas. As the solution is given by mouth, ordinary drinking water is used, and the solution should not be autoclaved. Oral maintenance therapy cuts intravenous needs of severely ill patients by 80%. In milder cases, oral therapy can completely replace intravenous therapy. The solution can be administered by nurses or medical assistants on the orders of a physician. Once a patient's blood pressure is normal, oral fluid can be given either by mouth or by way of a nasogastric tube to match continued diarrhea losses. After treatment has been started, a rectal swab should be taken. Culture of this specimen will confirm the diagnosis and permit accurate public health reporting. Once culture specimens have been collected, Tetracycline or furosolidine should be given. This will stop the diarrhea early, reducing the requirement for fluids and shortening hospitalization. Oak Villages field treatment centers have been established. At this center, in a tent, successful therapy has been given with only the simplest of equipment. The only true essentials for satisfactory cholera treatment are an individual skilled in judging and replacing fluid losses, the proper solutions, the tubing and needles with which to give intravenous fluids, and tetracycline or furosolidine. During epidemic situations, this irreducible minimum has been used with over 99% recovery. To recapitulate the important points of therapy, the patient is quickly evaluated as he enters the treatment center. Intravenous therapy of severely dehydrated patients is begun immediately. The wrinkled fingers, known as washerwoman's hands, and the loss of skin turgors signal severe dehydration. The rapid, deep breathing suggests metabolism. Absence of the radial pulse and unobtainable blood pressure indicate hypovolemic shock. The heart sounds are faint and in severe cases almost inaudible. Initial rehydration can be quickly accomplished through any large vein. In small children and infants, a scalp vein needle in the external jugular vein is often successful. The femoral vein is used if necessary. Oral fluid should be used to reduce the need for intravenous fluids. It must always be remembered that proper regulation of the rate of intravenous and oral fluid replacement is the key to survival of all cholera patients. Careful bedside records of output are essential to the correct administration of replacement fluids. Tetracycline or furosolidine is used to stop the diarrhea early. Proper treatment is the most important part of any cholera control program. With intravenous and oral fluid replacement therapy, patients recover and confidence is restored. Person-to-person -person spread is not important in transmission. Medical personnel and laboratory workers should not be fearful of their own safety. They almost never become ill with cholera. With modern treatment methods, cholera need no longer be thought of as a dread disease.